I think a deer sanctuary, a buck sanctuary in general, is probably the most overused and abused term that there is out there because everyone has a sanctuary when they typically do not. And we'll talk about how most properties have zero acres that are dedicated to all deer for all time within that core area. And let's just say this is a 40 acre parcel. And I use 40 acres because it's a very common size. I'd say half my clients every year are 60 acres or less and a huge percentage are right around 40 acres. It's just a common deer size. It's affordable to a lot of deer hunters without having to have a lot of acres. And as it makes sense, you know, some people have enough acres. You could have 800, 1,000 acres, 1,500 acres, and you can do well on it just because the size of the parcel encompasses your mistakes. And what I mean by that is you could drive a bus to a tree stand and park it under the tree stand and make all kinds of commotions. Somewhere on that property, you're going to have an area that's still untouched by deer. They can't see you, hear you, or smell you. And again, the size of the parcel encompasses your hunting mistakes. So you can actually have some true sanctuary on the property. And even then, there's a lot of people that need 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 acres to actually have 40 acres or 100 acres of actual all deer all the time. It's because of the way they hunt. Where I want you to get the most out of your acres, that's what I need to do as a landowner and as a hunter, as someone who manages property. I wanna make sure that you're not the type of person that needs 1,200 acres because you hunt poorly or you don't understand this concept of what a true sanctuary is. So let's say a 40 acre parcel, I have a lot of people. We'll go with this 10 acre corner right here. They'll say in here, this is my sanctuary. Haven't been in there in three years, even in the off season. And I encourage you in your sanctuaries, if it's not deer season, go in there and check them out. See what you're actually holding. Count the rubs, count the scrapes. Look at actual deer beds. See what deer are actually using within that sanctuary. A lot of sanctuaries, most sanctuaries that I see are not true sanctuaries. The reason for that, there could be an access trail. We're not going in the 10 acres, but we go around it. They go down here to hunt a stand. They can hunt that stand with the wind blowing in this direction. What does that mean? That means the entire time that they're walking along this parcel, the scent is blowing into the parcel. And in an area that's only 220 yards by 220 yards, you effectively, with your scent, push the majority of the deer out of there. And you could say, well, we drive an ATV, so the deer don't care. But if they can see it, they can hear it, they can smell it. Sure, some of those does and fawns, doe family groups get used to it. They can take a lot more stress, but you're not gonna have a mature buck on the property in that situation. And what happens is, is someone might even come this way and they're hunting this stand with the wind blowing this way. And they say, well, we're waiting for deer to come off the property. I go to a lot of parcels where stands are on the borders because they're waiting for deer to come back from the neighbors because they push them off their property, even though they have a 10 acre sanctuary. And in this case, likely, if someone's making a lot of noise coming here, let's say they have a stand location right here that they go down to, and in that one, they need the wind to go this way, so they're taking out this spot. Maybe you come around here, you hunt a stand here that needs the wind blowing this way. Eventually, three or four stands in a 40 acre parcel, you have zero acres left that you could dedicate to all deer all the time. And if a deer can see you, hear you or smell you, it's not truly a sanctuary. Instead, I look at percentage of efficiency of your land. So what is your land's efficiency and how does that relate to actually creating a sanctuary? Well, for one thing, your food sources. So let's say you have food plots, or you have a food plot down in this corner, however it lays out, you have another one up here. Your food plot should always be a part of that sanctuary. Most people think, you know, again, these deer are bedding back here somewhere. You have bedding area, bedding, 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 and all these beds are supplying daily movement to this food source. But if you spook out the food plot, you don't have deer in the bedding areas. Again, you might have some does and fawns, young bucks to play around in there. Take an ATV right through it. You spook out those deer you're not going to have room for the older bucks in the neighborhood, whatever older is, two or three years, old in some areas, some areas five, six, seven. Again, no sanctuary. Instead, 
Let's say you have a stand right here. You have a stand here. Let's say you have a travel quarter right here. Maybe a marsh down here where there's no deer. You have stands in between those bedding areas. You have stand around the food stand. Draw a line in the sand. And you can say, okay, the food pot's a sanctuary because you're not spooking deer out of it. Your stand locations, your access. So in a case like this, out of 40 acres, ah, you could probably guess you have 28 acres, 29 acres dedicated to all deer all the time. That 29 acres out of 40, let's just call it an even 30 for simple math, 30 acres out of 40, you would have 75% efficiency for attracting deer on your parcel. Again, that first example, if you have a sanctuary down here and you're spooking out that sanctuary and you have a couple other stands, you're not being careful on the property. So many properties I go to, it doesn't matter if it's 100 acres, 200 acres, 40 acres or 20, there's zero acres left. So where you can actually call this core area right here that represents that area where your sight, sound, and scent while you hunt is being controlled. That means you need to have quiet stands. That means you have, need to have quiet access. And unfortunately, there's people out there who believe me, won't believe me, they'll say, oh, I'm just gonna drive my ATV to the stand. You know, like I say all the time, I hope that you're my neighbor <laughs> because you're gonna spook deer off the property. It's gonna make me have a better chance of actually being the herd influencer in the area. And when you start to add up your access and where your stands are located, I'll even say, well, someone will want to get back to a bedding area right here. And they'll say, well, I'm hunting this bedding area for whatever reason, it's my best one. I hunt it with only my scent blowing out. Well, now you just destroyed 10 acres of your property, probably 15 to 18, just to get to one stand location that's in the interior of your property. You can't afford to do that. That core deer area that you're trying to develop. So you're trying to come up with a plan that manages your sight, your sound, and your scent. That core area that's left over, that core area includes bedding areas, your food sources, the travel in between, and it might even be that you have a house in the middle of all this. You have your house right in the middle, you have a driveway coming in, well then you're always going out and you're blowing your scent back at the house. You take out an area like this, for your access, you add up the acres around, in a way you can be that you can come out to the street, you can go around, you can get into a stand location here, here. And when you add up this area between your stands and all around the property, you still will work out an average where you're still looking at 20 acres out of 40 is for all deer all the time. It could be that there's no home in the center here in this entire area because you have good access from two sides or even one side, you use that access around your property, that you're still maintaining that 50% efficiency ratio where those are the number of acres that are working for you on your land to actually hold, attract deer, advance them to the next, next age class, build a quality deer herd, and therefore when you do so, you're building a quality hunt. And ask yourself, what is the core deer area on your land? where deer don't hear you, see or smell you. Now, everyone has to go in and retrieve deer. That's a celebration. We go in at night most of the time if we can after dark to get those deer because I find there's a lot lower impact after dark, especially with using vehicles at that time, leaving the machines running, keeping your voices down, less impact on the land at that time as opposed to going in the middle of the property and in the middle of the day and going and retrieving deer. So you have to have, still make smart de uh, decisions. For example, doe harvest. Beginning of the season, end of the season. Great time to shoot does. When it gets to November 15th in Michigan, for example, all those Michigan gun openers, that's a time where you don't want to harvest does. I've had clients, they shoot three does one year on opening day, five years another year on opening day, just destroying all their efforts that they've worked on and paid for all year long, let alone the resources having myself or Dylan come out to the property, design it. You know, what a waste if you're just gonna do that on open day at the time where your property should be the most critical. Now, if you have a buck on the ground, great time to go in and shoot a doe. You have a buck on the ground, you're in the stand, there's two does there, you have two doe tags, you've determined you need to shoot does. You're not just shooting does for the heck of it. 
you're actually making a management decision that you'd actually need to shoot does, you're shooting them, and you get all, you retrieve all three deer at the same time, great time to do so. What's a buck sanctuary? What's a deer sanctuary in general? That's an often overused term. Think about those areas where deer can't see you, hear you, or smell you when you're accessing the land, getting out of the land. Think about putting a priority on those food plots. You can build the best bedding areas in the world, doe bedding and then buck bedding. Doe bedding next to the food source, buck bedding on the other side of doe bedding. You can build the best buck beddings in the, on the planet, in the habitat for your area. However, if you're not maintain, maintaining that food plot as a sanctuary, then you're not going to have deer that are using those bedding areas. You're not going to have that consistent morning use of tree stands and assemblage of stands where you can hunt bedding areas in the morning. You're not going to have that consistent movement to food. And it all begins with food on private parcels. And you can extend that to public land. You blow out the food sources that deer are eating on a daily basis. You're not going to have a true sanctuary out on public land. And that's a shame because a lot of times you're hunting thousands of acres. You can get in and away from people. And uh, I truly believe that with an hour to an hour and a half of just about everyone in the country, you can find great deer hunting on public land if you'd actually take the time to do so and step outside of that comfort level. But even then, finding a great spot, you still have to maintain your hunting pressure levels and maintain that your sight, your sound, your scent is not blowing into bedding areas, travel corridors, into those deer use areas. You're maintaining a percentage of efficiency within the land that you have to work with. That'll determine how well you're doing with your property. And unfortunately, there's people out there that have 500 acres, 900 acres, seven, and, uh, if it weren't for that size of parcel, they probably would never shoot a nice buck because the size of the parcel encompasses their mistakes. I want to see you get the most money out of your property. Why buy 300 acres when you can do the same job on 50 acres? And that's a true statement. There's a lot of people that maximize. That's what I try to do. That's what I try to teach my clients to do. That's what I try to teach you as a viewer uh, to do is to maximize that 50 acre parcel, that 40, that 20 acres, that 100, 200 acre parcel and make it look like it's 10 times larger to the average person because you've established a true core deer area that is at least 50% of your land. And for that, you've actually created a true sanctuary on your property where deer don't see you, hear you, or smell you the majority of the time that you hunt. Now out of the season, again, get in there, do some exploring, see where deer are actually bedding. I was on a uh, 10 acre sanctuary down in Southern Michigan one time. And they said, you know, we haven't been in there for five years, literally stepped foot on it. We went in there and there'd been a blowdown about four or five years earlier. Um, big, giant, red maple, maybe silver maple, but they'd blown over sideways and they were stacked on top of each other. We had to literally crawl, climb, and really work hard to get through that parcel. There was no deer sign because the deer couldn't use it. So that was an example of a sanctuary that whether they blew their scent into it, the deer could hear them or see them within there. There weren't any deer because the habitat was so poor. It pays to get in there, explore your sanctuaries, really develop a true core area, and enjoy an actual sanctuary that you can assemble morning stands, evening stands, and get the most out of your investment for especially these expensive deer properties and how much they're going for acre nowadays and per acre. And uh, I wanna see you get the most out of your property and for that, build a great herd and then build that great hunt that follows. Hey guys, I really appreciate you watching today's video. We're out here having some fun today. We're planting some switchgrass, cutting some timber, making some bedding areas, but most importantly, we're putting it all together and that's critical. Any habitat improvements that you're making, you can't just make improvements because it's a good spot. You have to link those together so that helps your hunt this fall. Really, I encourage you to check out my web classes. The link is in the description. It's helped a lot of folks design their properties and do what we're out here having fun doing right now.